So two months ago, I was in a classroom when we were discussing leadership. And our teacher said to us, the person, excuse me, our teacher said to us, the family a person comes from says a lot about their leadership ability. And then he asked us this, do you really want a person from a dysfunctional family leading our school? I proudly come from a dysfunctional family. My father was a heroin addict, so by the age of six, I knew that my family was a little different from everyone else's. Now, I instinctively knew not to tell people that my dad forgot my birthday, but there were also things I was directly told not to tell people, like our van trip to deliver a bag of dog food an hour into the city to someone with no dog, or his new job that paid cash out of a broken window. Well, then I turned eight and my father went missing. I was in the second grade and I had a best friend named Caitlin and we did everything together. I went over to her house almost every day after school and her mom would watch me while my mom was at work. I ate dinner with them, I went to church camps with them, and it got to the point that Caitlin's house started to feel like mine too. Well, one day my mother mentioned to Caitlin's mother that my father was a drug addict who had disappeared. And as I was standing outside waiting to be picked up from school, Caitlin's little sister ran up to give me a hug and her father grabbed her and dragged her away from me like I was a monster. And that was the last time I ever stepped foot in their house. I lost my best friend. So at eight, I learned to be very ashamed of my family's dysfunction. Well, five years later, I'm in junior high, and I'd gotten so good at lying that I could convince all my friends my dad was around. And it was at this point that my counselor, because people with dysfunction tend to have those, told me that this lying was extremely unhealthy and that the reason I felt alone every day of my life was because I believed that if my friends knew who my father was, they would never speak to me again. So she insisted that I tell someone about my dad. So now at 13, I've learned that hiding dysfunction is unhealthy. So I took her advice and I called up my best friend, my first boyfriend at 13, he was really cute. <laughs> and, um, and I called him up and I was crying and I told him all the difficult things that I'd been through and he hung up awkwardly because he was 12, but for the next week, everything went really well and I didn't feel alone. Well, then he started to tell me that I was just so lucky to have him because I was never gonna have anyone else and that he didn't even wanna be with me, but I was so pathetic that he was gonna stay with me out of pity. So now I'm 14 and my new psychologist tells me that he is verbally and emotionally abusive and I thought, no way. No way, he couldn't be abusive, he was my best friend. In fact, at that time, I thought of him as my only friend. Well, when she realized that I was ignoring her, she told me that if I did not break up with him, she would break confidentiality and tell my mother. I broke up with him. <laughs> so then, I learned that if you tell a few people about your dysfunction, it puts, it puts you at risk to be hurt and manipulated. So now I'm 14 years old and I apply to Culver Academies for high school. And one of the essay questions is, how have you approached the biggest challenge in your life? Well, I was ready to lie, but Culver has an honor code. <laughs> so I sucked it up and I wrote the essay honestly. And an incredible thing happened. I got accepted. So at 15, for the first time, I had been taught that you didn't have to hide your dysfunction. And I thought that I was old enough to be judged on who I am and never again on how I grew up. And optimistically, I believed that for a whole year, which is really long at 16. And then two months ago, I walked into my favorite class, which was taught by a teacher who knew how I grew up because he had put out an assignment that required we share our backstories with the class. And when he said, the family a person comes from says a lot about their leadership ability. And then, do you really want a person from a dysfunctional family leading our school? I felt my heart breaking. And he said, now I'm not saying they can't. I'm just saying it's definitely something we should be considering. I got out of that class and I just sobbed. I could never succeed as a leader at a leadership school because I was already a failure. Dysfunction is nothing other than the failure to be normal within a given community standards. 
But everyone in this room has faced failure before. And we have the same problems. Because if you hide your failures, that's dishonest. But if you only tell a few, then they can be used against you. And if you don't hide them at all, you can be ridiculed and even denigrated. So what are we supposed to do? Well, there's a program called Alateen. And uh, it's a branch off of AA, which is a 12-step spiritual program designed to help people with their alcohol addictions. But Alateen isn't fo on, focused on teenage alcoholics. It's focused on teenagers who come from families of dysfunction. And Alateen is a great program, but the problem with it is that since it's spiritual and anonymous, it can't help every teenager. Right now in America, there is only one environment that consistently acknowledges dysfunction within teenagers and encourages pride for those affected by it. That environment is a gang. Now, I live by Chicago, which is where my father went missing eight years ago. And according to ABC News, since my father went missing in 2009, all the way up until 2012, we've seen a 25% increase in gang activity. And the scary thing is that the average age for the people in these gangs is 16 to 19 years old. At the end of the day, our stigmas about dysfunction and failure aren't just pushing people to take their own lives. They're causing homicide. Our lack of support for one another is literally killing people every day. So how do we start to solve this problem? Well, the first step to embracing other people starts with embracing who you are, to accept the pros and cons of our own situations. Now, if you come from a perfect family, which doesn't exist, by the way, but if you convince yourself that, if you, that you came from the perfect family, it would be easy to think that you're unbelievably lucky. But there's disadvantages there too, because right off the bat, you can't relate to how most of the world grew up. And unless you do something to address that, you're going to have a level of ignorance. And similarly, if you grew up with a lot of dysfunction, it's very easy to feel unlucky. But you can relate to an abundance of people. You have perspective and the ability to reach out and help people like you in a way that nobody else can. And we need to start recognizing that instead of hiding it. So the first step essentially is to look in the mirror. The second step is to love what we see. Now, it's not easy to be proud of failure and dysfunction. In fact, it's not even easy to be comfortable with them but we need to try. Here's why. When I came into Culver as a freshman, I was in a big group of people, and I got invited to a football game, because that's what you do in high school. And so I couldn't go, because I had a psychologist appointment that night. So I took a deep breath, and I stuck my chin in the air a little bit, and I said, I can't go, I have a psychologist appointment. And everybody froze. And I felt my heart stop, because that was a terrifying moment. And I was so scared of how everyone else was going to react. But it was just a moment, and we moved on, and nobody said anything offensive, and it was fine. But then almost a month later, a boy from that group reached out to me, and he asked me about the psychologist at Culver. Because even though it was a scary moment for me, for him, it was the start of something really important. And side note here, we really need to be talking about mental health and accepting ourselves more openly. But back to the point. <laughs> That's why embracing ourselves is so important. Because if you look, talk, and act like you're OK with who you are and where you come from, that will impact other people, even if you don't feel that way yet. And that's incredible. Now, the next two steps are for the greater community. <clears throat> for one, we need to attack these stigmas about dysfunction and failure in our education systems. And that has to start with the faculty. Because right now, there's this idea going around in schools that if you mess up as a teacher and your students see it, that makes you a bad teacher. And that's kind of garbage. <laughs> We've got to get rid of that. We've got to get rid of that because we remain teachers and students, in essence, our whole lives. 
And there's so much more to failure than just looking at it as an opportunity for growth. Right now, we're teaching kids that if you just work hard enough, you can overcome dysfunction and you can overcome failure. But that's not the point. The point is to embrace it, to understand that it's OK to be a part of who you are. And then you grow from it. And then, of course, you should never tell your students that coming from a background of dysfunction means they can't be leaders or anything else. For one, that's kind of ignorant. <laughs> and for another, a generation that loves the story of Hamilton and pictures of Obama smoking weed, we aren't likely to believe you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so the last step is for, um, for a program. I'm advocating for a program across the nation, possibly even bigger, that isn't in place of Alateen, but is alongside it that is focused not on being anonymous, but in being open, and having teenagers be able to reach out to each other, communicate with each other, and then talk to each other outside of meetings, to utilize our language of social media to find role models, to inspire each other, and not to hide or bully each other anymore. We need a program. So, to embrace the people around us, to love and accept where we're coming from and where we're going, and to move forward as a nation and as a world to being comfortable in our own skin, that all starts with each of us. It starts with looking back at those pros and cons, recognizing them, accepting them, moving towards embracing them, and educating our children. So, do you really want a person from a dysfunctional family leading our school. Kids from dysfunctional backgrounds and kids who have experienced abundances of failures have the tools to lead a lot more than just a school. And I believe that we can do it. Thank you.